So, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, and you're welcome to this morning's press briefing. We thank you for handing our invitation, and to thank you for using your media platforms to inform the Ghanaian people about the bank's monetary policy decisions. This morning's press briefing follows the meetings of the MPC last week, and this morning the chairman of the committee will speak to us. We'll give you the press an opportunity to ask questions at the end of his presentation. We're live on Facebook, Facebook at the Bank of Ghana, on the Bank of Ghana website, bog.go.gh, and on YouTube, Bank of Ghana. It's time to listen to the chairman. I respectfully invite the chairman of MPC and governor of Bank of Ghana, Dr. Nesadison, to deliver a statement for this morning. Chairman, I make a round of applause as we welcome, chairman. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sami. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the media, and welcome to the press briefing for the 114th Monetary Policy Committee meetings, which took place last week. The committee deliberated on recent global and domestic macroeconomic developments assess the performance of the economy and the risks to the outlook for inflation. A summary of the assessments and key considerations that informed the committee's decision on the positioning of the monetary policy rate is as follows. Global economic conditions have weakened since the last MPC meeting in July 2023. Recent incoming data show some loss in momentum in the manufacturing and services sectors on the back of lower export demand and tighter financing conditions. Also, the sharp rebound in China's recovery during the first quarter has recently moderated due to slower consumer spending following a renewed decline in the housing sector as well as a sharp decline in exports reflecting weaker external demand. The IMF has revised global growth to slow down from 3.5% in 2022 to 3% in both 2023 and 2024. For emerging market and developing economies, Growth is projected to be broadly stable at 4% in 2023 and 4.1% in 2024. Global headline inflation is projected to fall from 8.7% in 2022 to 6.8% in 2023 and 5.2% in 2024. However, the recent increase in crude oil prices exerted some upward pressures on headline inflation in some advanced economies, although core inflation steadily declined, despite robust labor markets and pass-through of past cost shocks. In most EMDEs, headline inflation also increased, driven by the pickup in oil prices and renewed currency pressures. Long-term inflation expectations, however, remain anchored, especially in advanced economies, reflecting the continued tightening policy posture of central banks and the recent declines in headline and core inflation. Global financing conditions remain tight due to rising interest rates, stronger U.S. dollar, and risk aversion for emerging market economies' assets. The prevailing high interest rates due to past policy rate hikes are still transmitting to financing costs. Also, the stronger U.S. dollar in recent months amid higher Treasury yields and increased demand has triggered renewed currency pressures, especially in emerging market and developing economies. On the domestic scene, economic growth was relatively strong in the first half of 2023, 
The latest data released by the Ghana Statistical Service show real GDP growth at 3.2% in the second quarter of 2023, marginally down from 3.3% in the first quarter, and compared with 3.5% in the same period of 2022. The observed growth outend was largely driven by the services and agriculture sectors, which grew by 6.3% and 6% respectively. However, industry contracted by 1.9%. Trends in the bank's high-frequency real sector indicators also pointed to a sustained turnaround in economic activity. The updated real composite index of economic activity contracted at a slower pace by 2.8% year-on-year in July 2023 indicating a slight improvement from a contraction of 3.1% in June 2023 and 3.7% in May 2023. The main indicators that contributed to the slight recovery in the index during the period were industrial consumption of electricity, private sector contributions to social security, and tourist arrivals. Credit to the private sector cement sales and port activity, however, slowed down over the period. Consumer and business sentiments were mixed, as indicated by the results from the bank's latest confidence surveys conducted in August 2023. While the business confidence index reflected the achievement of short-term company targets with positive sentiments about industry prospects due to improving consumer demand and the relative stability of the local currency. Consumer confidence index tipped due to the utility tariff adjustments and recent increases in export petroleum prices. Ghana's purchasing managers index for August 2023, on the other hand, increased for the sixth successive month, pointing to a sustained improvement in business activity. The latest price reading in August 2023 indicated a fall in the headline inflation after consecutive upward trends in May 2023. Headline inflation dropped to 40.1% from 43% in July and 42.5% in June 2023, respectively. The observed decline in inflation was broad-based with a stronger easing of food price pressures and the sustained easing of non-food price pressures observed in recent months. Food inflation declined sharply by 3.1% to 51.9% in August 2023, down from 55% in July 2023. Non-food inflation also declined further to 30.9% from 33.8% in the same comparative period. In line with developments in headline inflation, underlying inflation pressures also moderated in August. All the bank's core inflation measures trended downwards, with inflation excluding energy and utility prices, decelerating to 41% in August 2023, from 44.2% in July 2023. Annual growth in broad money supply, M2+, plus, increased sharply to 40.8% in August 2023, relative to 23.4% in August 2022, driven by a significant expansion in both net domestic assets and net foreign assets of the banking sector. The growth in M2+, plus reflected both in domestic currency and foreign currency deposits. Growth in reserve money, however, moderated to 25.5% from 33.1% over the same comparative period, reflecting stronger liquidity management operations of the Bank of Ghana, which supported increased sterilization over the period. In August 2023, private sector credit in year-on-year -year terms 
increased moderately by 10.7% relative to 35.8% growth recorded in August 2022. In real terms, credit to the private sector contracted by 21% relative to a growth of 1.4% over the same comparative period, reflecting increased risk aversion of banks during the period. At the auctions for Government of Ghana securities, the 91-day and 182-day Treasury bill rates decreased marginally to 26.35%, and 27.84% respectively in August, down from 27.68% and 29.12% in the same month of 2022. The rate on the 364-day instrument, however, increased to 30.8% from 28.9% over the same comparative period. All the rates were, however, negative in real terms, given the rate of inflation. The rate at which banks borrowed from each other, that is, the interbank weighted average rate, rose to 26.59 percent in August 2023, from 21.93 percent in August 2022, in line with the increases in the monetary policy rate. Consequently, average lending rates of banks increased to 31.78% in August 2023 from 27.96% recorded in August 2022. The banking sector remained stable as the industry's total assets increased to 244.7 billion Ghana CDs in August 2023 from 204.6 billion Ghana CDs in August 2022. The growth in banks' assets was funded by deposits, which grew sharply by 38.9% to 189.9 billion Ghana cities from 136.7 billion Ghana cities in the same comparative period. Total borrowings by banks, however, contracted by 41% to 13.9 billion Ghana cities in August 2023 from 23.5 billion Ghana cities a year earlier. Banks' profitability remained strong in the first eight months of 2023. The industry recorded profit after tax of 5.7 billion Ghana cities, representing a 41.4% annual growth, compared with 26.5% growth recorded last year. Specifically, net interest income increased sharply by 37.9% to 13.5 billion Ghana cities, while net fees and commissions went up by 27.3% to 2.9 billion Ghana cities. The key financial soundness indicators remain broadly stable. Profitability indicators improved with a return on equity at 36.9% in August 2023 from 23% in August 2022, while return on assets increased to 5.4% from 4.7% in the same comparative period. Also, liquidity indicators for the industry improved during the period under review. Capital adequacy ratios adjusted for the regulatory release was 14.2% in August 2023, higher than the revised prudential minimum of 10%. The industry's non-performing loan ratio, however, increased to 20% in August 2023 from 14.3% in August 2022 attributable to elevated credit risks associated with the lagged effect of the macroeconomic crisis in 2022. International prices of Ghana's major export commodities recorded some gains in August 2023 after consistent declines in the previous months. Crude oil prices increased by 4% to 84.6 US dollars per barrel in August 2023 
due to expectations of tight crude oil supplies following Saudi Arabia and Russia's decision to extend production cuts for the rest of the year. Cocoa prices recorded a year-to-date growth of 37.1% to 3,480.3 US dollars per ton in August 2023 on account of tight supplies in West Africa. Gold prices also gained 6.8% year-to-date to settle at 1,918.8 US dollars per fine ounce, largely due to expectations of a pause in the U.S. policy tightening cycle. In the first eight months of the year, the trade account registered a surplus of 2 billion U.S. dollars compared with 1.6 billion U.S. dollars recorded in the same period of last year. This was largely due to import compression and a decline in exports. Total export earnings declined by 8.9% year on year to 10.8 billion US dollars driven mainly by a significant drop in crude oil and cocoa products exports in the review period crude oil exports decreased by 1.5 billion US dollars due to an 18.8% fall in production volumes as well as a 23.6% decline in prices Exports of cocoa beans and products remain broadly unchanged at 1.6 billion US dollars compared with the same period in 2022 as the higher production volume of the beans balanced out the lower volumes of cocoa products. Gold exports increased to 4.7 billion US dollars on account of an 8.5% rise in the volumes exported and 1.9% increase in prices. Earnings from other exports, including non-traditional exports, decreased marginally by 1.6% to 2.1 billion US dollars. Total imports contracted by 14.7% to 8.8 billion US dollars from 10.3 billion US dollars a year earlier. This was attributed to a 13.1% contraction in non-oil imports to 6.1 billion US dollars, as well as a dip in oil and gas imports of 18.2% to 2.7 billion US dollars. On the external position, the balance of payments for the first six months of the year recorded some improvements. The current accounts recorded a surplus of 859.1 million US dollars from a deficit of 1.1 billion US dollars last year. The sharp improvement in the current account reflected a significant reduction in external debt service payments on the euro bonds, bilateral, and some commercial loans, resulting in over 2 billion US dollars of savings in the year to September 2023 due to the external debt service standstill. For the same period in 2022, the current account recorded a deficit of 2.5 billion US dollars. At the end of August 2023, gross international reserves, excluding encumbered assets and petroleum funds, stood at 2.1 billion US dollars equivalent to one month of import cover, compared with 1.5 billion US dollars, 0.6 month of import cover recorded at the end of December 2022. Gross reserves broadly defined to include encumbered assets and petroleum funds at the end of August 2023 stood at 5.1 billion US dollars. The Ghana city has remained stable from the beginning of the year to date, except in January, when it depreciated sharply on account of the uncertainties at the end of 2022 associated with the launch of the DDEP. The Ghana city depreciated by 20.6% in January 2023 and has remained 
generally stable since then, with a cumulative depreciation of 2.5% between February and September 18, 2023. The relative stability in the foreign exchange market reflected improved foreign exchange supply, including IMF flows, Bank of Ghana's domestic gold purchasing program, and the purchases of repatriated export proceeds from mining companies and oil and gas producers, which amounted to about 1.9 billion US dollars as at the end of August 2023. Furthermore, the bank's foreign exchange forward auctions for bulk oil distribution companies have helped remove the disorderly conduct in the market and contributed to exchange rate stability. Summary and Outlook In sum, the committee noted the moderation in global economic activity arising from high inflation, tighter financing conditions, weak demand weighing down on manufacturing output, as well as the moderation in China's recovery after the sharp rebound in the first quarter. The slowdown in global growth momentum is, however, concentrated in advanced economies with the euro area being a key downside risk. But emerging market and developing economies are expected to pose some strong growth at 4% in 2023. Global inflation is expected to remain above central bank targets for an extended period due to strong labor markets and pass-through of energy price shocks. The disinflation process is projected to take longer than expected, requiring moderately tighter policies, while growing uncertainty about the global growth outlook could trigger repricing of risky assets, sharp tightening of financing conditions, and further strengthening of the U.S. dollar. These could transmit to the domestic economy through the trade and financial channels. On the domestic front, the committee observed the overall improving macroeconomic conditions with relatively strong economic growth and a drop in inflation in August. These developments provide evidence that the policy mix under the three-year IMF extended credit facility is beginning to yield results. Economic activity is rebounding strongly. The exchange rate is stabilizing, inflation is declining, and the level of foreign exchange reserves has improved. Sustained improvement in these indicators should result in the restoration of real incomes and purchasing power. The strong growth outturn observed in the first half of 2023 is expected to continue in the third quarter as indicated by the July 2023 update of the bank CIEA. Also, Ghana's PMI lent support to the growth outlook, reflecting improving business conditions. The results from the confidence survey so far also indicate continued improvement in business and consumer sentiments, influenced by the relative stability in the Ghana city and more recently, the resumption of the disinflation process. The pickup in confidence is expected to continue for the rest of the year in line with improving macroeconomic conditions. On the implementation of fiscal policy, while policies remain consistent with the IMF-supported program thus far, challenges associated with revenue mobilization persist and will require additional efforts to safeguard the revenue-led fiscal adjustment program. The country's external sector position has continued to improve significantly in the first eight months of the year, supported by a current account surplus, reflecting higher gold export receipts, import compression, and lower outflows from the services and income accounts. The lower balance of payments deficit, the domestic gold purchase program, as well as inflows from the mining sector, and the liquidation of short-term external liabilities contributed to rebuilding the country's reserve buffers. 
in the last quarter of the year, reserve accumulation would be further bolstered by the expected inflows from the cocoa syndication loan, the second tranche of the IMF ECF facility, and other multilateral inflows. On inflation dynamics, the continued maintenance of a tight monetary policy stance and relative exchange rate stability have contributed significantly to the disinflation process observed in the year thus far. Headline inflation has declined by a cumulative 14% since the peak of 54.1% recorded in December 2022. Non-food inflation has also declined sharply by close to 20%, broadly reflecting the effectiveness of monetary policy. All core inflation measures monitored by the central bank are trending downwards, indicating continued easing of underlying inflation pressures. In addition, one year ahead survey-based inflation expectations seem well anchored. While the disinflation process has resumed, which should result in a gradual return towards the target band over the medium term, bearing unanticipated shocks, rising international crude oil prices, and adjustments to utility tariffs remain a risk to the outlook, which would have to be managed through monetary policy vigilance. Given these considerations, the committee decided to maintain the policy rate at 30%. The committee further indicated that while the expectation is for continued disinflation, it stands ready to respond appropriately should inflation deviate from these broad expectations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very big round of applause from Mr. Chairman. If you've just joined our live broadcast, this is the 114 MPC press briefing, and thank you for joining in. I want to thank some of the media houses who are streaming the press briefing on the um, networks. Ghana Web, Ghana News Agency, and Business and Financial Times. Thank you very much. Sema, with your permission, it's question time. Uh, Pretz, um, as always, your name and media house. But respectfully, this is not a platform to ask questions about the 2022 BOG financial statement and bank building. This is the press briefing for the MPC. Thank you very much. Echo, Najeble. Uh, Toma Elom, and then George Laffey. So I call. All right. Thank you, Governor, and good morning. Governor, what is your growth and inflation target for end year? And by what volume and how much has the Gold for Reserve program contributed to your buffers? And how significant or otherwise has it been, especially in these trying times where we are talking about? One percent, uh, one month of import cover among. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you. Go. Thank you now. Good morning, Governor. My name is Naja Gliago with GBC Radio Division. Um, Mr. Governor, um, we we saw in the financial data released on Friday that uh, gross international reserves dropped to five point one billion dollars from the seven. Seven zero four point zero billion dollars a year to date. What may have accounted for this? And again, we realized that um, there was over and over subscription of government's August 2023 Treasury offering by 0.49 million cities. Can we say that we are regaining the much desired financial sector confidence? Thank you. Okay, now thank you, Toma. Very brief. for uh, emergency liquidity assistance and under the circumstances is the um, Bank of Ghana in position to provide such assistance to deserving banks if they need such assistance. Then the other thing I, I, I didn't know is 
you've done an asset quality review at this current time. Does it imply or is there any plan by the Bank of Ghana to now set like, specific banks um, minimum capital levels according to their risk profiles? As different from an overall general minimum capital. Then the last thing is just that what is the bank's stance on provisions by banks against investments in treasury bills? Is there an overall provision thing? I know it used to be one percent for government treasury. Is there any position there? Um hello. Thank you. But my name is Elom. I write for Economic Times. Um Sir Governor, you said inflation has returned to the defl inflation has returned to disinflation. It has resumed to disinflation. I just wanted to find out if the quarterly review of the utility prices is no any threat to to inflation, more especially as the central bank has eliminated its financing to government, and more so whether we should expect any further hiking policy rates before the end of the year. And secondly, how much are we expecting from the cocoa loan syndication? Thank okay. you. Thank you. Ask question for this one, George Raffi. Yeah, my name is George Raffi, Joy FM, and then uh, Joy News. I just want to uh, find out from you, uh, Doc, how's the exchange rate dynamics feeding into the debt stock? Because if you look at your import data, uh, there isn't much in terms of expenditure and import as well. So what is feeding into the spike in terms of the debt stock? If you can help me, I'll be grateful. Also, how's the the IMF expected inflows that will come in, all the indicators point to the fact that we are going to pass this review. How would the inflows and also other things impact on investor sentiment and the expected recovery or stabilizing the economy from the Bank of Ghana's perspective? You talked about how the fund program had contributed to some of the things that we've had. There are some who are still arguing that we are yet to see the full benefit of this program to the economy compared to countries like Zambia. So if you can help me out, I'll be grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for this first set of questions. A course, question on the inflation and growth outlook. If you look at the IMF program, the growth target was set at 1.5%. Now, we have been looking at the GDP numbers that have been coming out uh, in the year so far. And we are seeing a 3.3% and a 3.2% for the first and second quarters. We've also looked at the behavior of our composite index of economic activity. And we have seen a positive trend in that indicator as well. We've also looked at the Ghana Purchasing Managers Index. Now, all these three statistics suggest to us that growth is probably more robust than expected under the IMF program. And we are projecting possibly a 3% growth, which is almost double the rate of growth under the IMF program. So those are the discussions that we had on, on growth last year. I think the consensus view of the Monetary Policy Committee is that we should see stronger growth than projected under the program. In terms of the inflation outlook, as you know, the longer term objective is to get back into a single digit target. That will take place over time. You're looking at a three year framework to return to the single digit target. But our projections, right, I think we did discuss this during the last MPC meeting that we were looking at a 29% you know, projection for 2023. And we were a little bit concerned uh, in the second quarter when inflation sort of got stuck around 42. But it, we, we think that with the drop that we have seen 
uh, in the August numbers, we probably are going to get back to the path we should lead us close to the 29% that we had originally forecasted. So that, that is a view of the, of the committee in terms of the growth and inflation outlook. Now, the domestic gold purchases program has been very innovative and has been very strong in helping stabilize the economy. It has been very strong in helping to keep the exchange rate stable. And I say so because on a year-to-date basis, we have bought gold to the tune of, of over $700 million for reserves. This is gold for reserves. The actual numbers are there. We can share the exact numbers with you. And then we have also bought gold for oil, probably even higher than the 700 million. So if you put the two together, you are looking at over 1.4, 1.5 billion US dollars just from our domestic gold purchases program. It is the single most important foreign exchange source in 2023, nearly double the amount of money that we have received from the IMF. So we are very, very proud about that particular initiative. So those were the two questions from the core. The volume spot, we will share that with you. That is available. Uh, I mean, we, we have bought about 13.7 tons, right? Uh, we started this program when we had a, I reserves 8.7 tons. So we've more than doubled the volume of tons that we held in our reserves uh, just about two years ago. So Naja Blair, your question was still on the gross reserves, same issue, but I think you were confusing the broad definition, right? The broad definition of reserves which include the encumbered and petroleum funds relative to the narrower definition where we exclude the encumbered and petroleum funds. You would see that we reported the narrow definition to be around 2.5 billion, and then the broader definition is about 5, 5 point, point something billion. So th those are the sources of the differences. And then you asked a question about oversubscription of uh, treasury bill, the auction market, which is not surprising uh, to the extent that the domestic debt exchange program has taken place. Uh, there is a, a lot of liquidity, and this is being channeled to the shorter dated instruments. Uh, the government itself is not issuing longer dated instruments. So all the liquidity in the economy is being used uh, to buy either 91-day paper or 182-day paper or at most the 364-day paper. So that is really what explains the oversubscription there. And yes, uh, to, to the extent that that show some confidence uh, in the market uh, that these instruments at least are yielding a return which is you, you know, uh, good enough for the investors. So that's what it means. And then Toma was very direct in this question of whether any bank had applied for liquidity assistance and, <laughs> and whether Bank of Ghana can assist. Yes, Bank of Ghana can assist. A lender of last resort. The banks are holding, what, 12% of their deposits with us as liquidity, right? So to the extent that we have those resources with us, we can use it to support any bank that, that needs liquidity. You know, the, your question is related to <laughs> the whether the monetary, I mean, the central bank can operate 
even in the presence of a negative equity? I know that is what is driving that question. <laughs> but that's why I'm telling you that we don't need positive equity to be effective, right? And, and you should, well, but I know, I know, I know what is driving the question. <laughs> Yes. So there's no debate about that. Yeah. No. I mean, at the end of the day, the banks give deposits with us. Twelve percent of total deposits is here. So <laughs> it's available to support the system, right? And we don't have to print money to do that. That's that's also the other side of of that question. And then on the AQR, yes, the AQRs, a limited AQR, I'm aware, has been done. That is just to guide, you know, the banking supervision uh, department. Uh, the bank has already uh, put into place a risk-weighted assets, you know, which is used for capital adequacy computation. So it, uh, this issue of risk-based you know, supervision is already there through the capital requirements, quite apart from the minimum capital requirement of 400 million. Banks also have to meet, you know, capital adequacy ratios, which are computed on the basis of the risk of their loan portfolio. So that is already there. I didn't get your last question, which... The last one, sir, what I'll ask you, sir, just as you were pointing out, as you were pointing out about the fact that, you know, banks now, everybody's investing in treasury bills. Right. Because we are not doing medium to long dated instruments anymore. What I was asking is that, is, does the Bank of Ghana require banks to make overall provisions against possible, against possible impairment, against possible impairment in their investment portfolio of treasury bills? I do remember that back in the last IMF program, in 2015, the IMF insisted the banks start making, I think, 1% overall provisions against their holdings in government securities. And I want to know what the situation has changed. We collect that, but we are not we are not asking banks to make provisions on the basis of any risks associated with the treasury, treasury market business. at all. Thank you. Uh, the provisions that they are making has to do with their credit portfolios, okay. lending lending portfolios. Selom goes back to the disinflation path. And I think your question is whether all these utility rate adjustments and uh, petroleum price increases and whether all of this, how all of this would impact, which we clearly explained in the release that I just read, that yes, there are these, you know, unanticipated shocks which will come through as we move on, but the bank would stand ready to respond appropriately. And by that we mean that we are focused on delivering our inflation target. For now, we think that the policy rate is appropriately positioned to deliver the inflation target. And should we change that assessment, we will at the appropriate time. We have one more meeting before the end of the year, and the assessments are done continuously. So at the next round of the MPC meeting, we would make that, that assessment. In terms of the COCO loan, the plan is for COCO board, I think they are looking at 800 million. That's the size of the COCO syndication. So depending on the pace at which, you know, the COCO purchases take place, we would know what the plans are for disbursement. George, your question was on how exchange rate is feeding the debt stock. I think this is what you are looking at. Probably being influenced by the statistical tables that we released, right? So if you look there, maybe on the basis of the exchange rate, you would see that the external debt in CD terms has, has increased. But we also did talk about the improvement in the current account balance, that one of the reasons that we have seen so much stability 
is for the fact that we have an external debt standstill, right? So compared to a year ago when we were paying a lot of money to service external debt, right? This year, we are not spending that money to service external debt. We've estimated nearly a savings of almost $2 billion arising out of just the debt service suspension for now, maybe. So that, that obviously is a major relief uh, to the balance of payments uh, and a major relief to the economy as a whole. Now, how will the IMF inflow impact sentiments? I'm sure you're aware the IMF is in town. From here, I'm moving to the Ministry of Finance for uh, initial meetings. I think the issue of confidence is at the heart of, of the entire program. And as we, you know, enumerated in this press release, we think that the program is doing what it is supposed to do, stabilize the economy, right? We are beginning to see growth improving. We are beginning to see inflation going down. If you look at the sizes of the drops uh, since the end of December, we've seen substantial drops in both food and on food inflation. We have seen the exchange rate stabilize. So th these are all ingredients. These are all ingredients that would create uh, the conditions for sustained growth. Now, when you have inflation coming down, when your exchange rate is staying stable, we expect real incomes to improve over time if we are able to sustain uh, this kind of progress. And all of that should help, you know, rebuild confidence. So we are very, very um, conscious of, of the reason for uh, first, you know, agreeing to do the program. Uh, the program is yielding the appropriate results. We are in the process of this first review, indications are that we would come out of the review very successfully. This is the indications that I'm getting. And if that happens, we would get a second disbursement from the fund before the end of the year. And together with other flows from the World Bank, all of that should help restore confidence uh, to the Ghanaian economy. So those who are arguing that they are here to see the benefit, the benefit is coming. It's already there. We are seeing the you know, improving inflation development. Everybody, everybody can see how stable the currency is. You don't, I don't have to tell you, you see it for yourself. So if you can't see it, then I don't know. <laughs> Improvements are coming. And the challenge is to sustain the improvements. And, and we hope that by doing that, all of us will feel it in our pockets through improvements in our real incomes. And this is really what the whole program is designed to do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, please, let's be very brief with our, our preambles. Uh, Joshua Maxwell uh, Kingsley. Morris and uh, Nanoi. Good morning. Uh, yes. My name is Morris with GTV. Governor, when are we likely to resume external debt servicing? I ask the question because much of the progress we've seen with our external position is as a result of external debt servicing standstill as you uh, you put it and import compression so in the face of a possible external debt servicing resumption how sustainable is the progress we're making so far um, we see an increase in non-performing loans 
what the bank's response to that and what are the drivers. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. All right, Governor, um, my name is Joshua from the Business and Financial Times. So given the current levels of um, high yields on the treasury market and also the oversubscription we've seen over the, the period um, almost this year, um, how long can the uh, company sustain, does the economy sustain such levels in terms of the yields? And how soon should there be a correction to this level of yields that we are seeing on the on the market? Also, given that the private sector um, credit has contracted so much by about 21%. All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, Kingsley. Kingsley, Ghanaian Times. So I want to find out from the governor when does he think or does the bank think we'll get back to our pre-pandemic uh, gross international reserve levels? And secondly, the Financial Stability Fund has still not been established. Do uh, you see it's a threat to the gains uh, the banking sector has choked? Thank you, Marshall. Okay, Governor, quick on the growth. Um, I guess it's for full year, but what accounts for the variation between your end and that of uh, the IMF and the, the Ministry of Finance? If I can get a sense of your expected drivers of the 3% growth for the year. And then on inflation, do I get the impression that from your perspective, you, you, you see a situation where we are on the disinflation part between now and, and December? And if that's the case, what, what level of room do you have for reduction to anchor the growth that you, you, you talk about? Thank you. Thank you. What's your name? Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Governor. Uh, you mentioned that the CD has been, um, has been stable. You mentioned that the CD has been stable um, since February to this time. Um, how do you plan to sustain that going into 2024, um, especially early January, February, because uh, we are now seeing importers stocking up for Christmas. It means that they are shopping. Uh, normally, we witness the depreciation at the beginning of the year. So what measures are you putting in place to, as it were, minimize if there should be any depreciation? My second one has to do with international money um, transfer operators. They are charging way above the interbank rate. Do you have a way of regulating them or their, their activities? And if so, how do you sanction those who overcharge? Uh, thank you. Last question for today, Justice. Okay. Justice, very brief. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Governor. Uh, I have two um, uh, facts finding. Uh, it's related to um, Kinsley's question. If some of our external partners promise some support for the Financial Stability Fund, um, what is the status of that? If these are not ready, how can we support local, especially um, unlisted local banks that may be facing some liquidity challenges? Secondly, some people believe that um, when the portfolio reversals and then you know the failure of some of the auctions started happening around last year, you could have consulted Parliament so that they place a cap on you know, fiscal spending, and which would have averted, you know, some of the, um, you know, the problems we had with the DDEP as a central bank. What do you think about that? And then lastly, where have we gotten to in trying to plug, you know, the regulatory loopholes that um, entities such as um, NAM1, what is their name? you know, men's gold uh, exploited to do what they did. What have we gotten to with trying to plug such regulatory loopholes? Thank you. Justice, so I asked two questions, you asked three questions. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I'm ready for your response. <laughs> well, thank you very much uh, for this round of questions. Starting with Maurice on external debt servicing. You seem to be suggesting that we will be paying for the debt later on. This is what I get from what you're saying. But 
we should not expect that we will be paying the debt later on. The discussions are ongoing. The discussions with the external creditors, both the bilaterals and the bondholders, are ongoing. We do not expect those discussions to fail. It's only in the case where the discussions fail that you would say that, oh, we are just postponing debt services, servicing, and we would eventually have to service the debt. But we expect the discussions to be successful. And the initial terms that I have seen suggest that they will be successful and our debt service payments will be significantly lower at the end of the discussions. This is still privileged information, so I cannot share it with you. I think that was your first question. And second question was the resumption of what was that? The resumption of the NPLs, the increase in NPLs, which should not surprise you when you have an economic crisis with inflation, exchange rate depreciating so sharply. These things spill over into the real sector of the economy. And therefore, we are not surprised uh, to see that the banks are recording higher uh, NPLs. Uh, we expect that they should stabilize. We probably have peaked in terms of the NPLs estimated at 20% or, or so. And going forward, first we have to deal with the macro. Going forward, we are dealing with the macro. We are seeing that the environment has stabilized, so the situation cannot get any worse than, than, than where it is. At the end of the day, the banks are, have, are having to make more provisioning to deal with these non-performing loans. It, it would also mean that they would have to eventually, you know, put in more capital to, to cover some of the losses that will come through because of NPLs. So that, that really is the issue there. And it's related to the plans for recapitalization of the banks, and we'll deal with that issue when we talk about the Financial Stability Fund. And then Joshua goes into PNFT, goes into the yields on the Treasury bills market, and you were asking about correction, when would the yields there correct, which is, in a sense, you're asking about when inflation will fall to 20% and 15%. This is really the, these are the drivers of the interest rates. So we expect that inflation is going down. As we continue to make progress on that, that front, we expect interest rates to correct. And then the interest rates would also be moving in, in, in the right direction. And as of now, despite the fact that you think that the yields are high. They are negative. We have negative uh, yields on the 91-day, 182-day instrument. The 364-day is also negative, right? But as we move towards 29 by the end of this year, these negative rates will start correcting, and then we may see some real positive rates. And then as inflation, you know, declines further, interest rates will generally come down. So that's the, 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 the underlying uh, issues about inflation would lead to the correction in interest rates. Kinsley, Ghanaian, Ghanaian Times, pre-pandemic level of reserves. When would we return? The program is a three-year program, right? So you're looking at 2023, 24, 25. And we hope that by the end of the three-year program, we would restore our reserves to the pre-pandemic levels. And then you asked about the Financial Stability Fund. The fund has been set up. The government's contribution, we all know, it's uh, 500 uh, million US dollars. The World Bank has contributed 250 million dollars. Hopefully, in the next week or two, I think the details about you know, how the funds will be disbursed would come out. So there's really no issue there. Uh, by the end of this month, 
we are in September, right? Let's say by the end of this month, early October, we should have the modalities out very clearly. And Maxwell asks the question about our inflation and growth projections. <laughs> the program has a projection, growth projection of 1.5, right? So these are some of the discussions we'll be having this week when we go to the ministry. This is the opening meeting with the IMF. And we have to convince them that from the indicators that we are seeing, we think that the 1.5% projection is too low. And, and then maybe provide the evidence that we provided you and, and discussed last week. The Ghana Statistical Service forecasts uh, our own real composite index of economic activity. Some of the you know, very fine details that we have seen which makes us think that we will do better than the 1.5% that the fund is projecting. But by, at the end of the mission, we would sort of have to reach an agreement on what the common view, the common view is regarding the, the growth outlook. And I believe the same discussion will go on regarding inflation. There will be technical sessions between the IMF team and, and, and the Bank of Ghana team on the inflation forecast, the underlying models, and what the models are showing. And then hopefully by the end of the mission, we'll have a consensus view of where all of this would be by the end of the year. So it's not that we have a different view and they have a different view. We are beginning to see some evidence which is pointing at a different number, and we are ready to discuss uh, those with them. So those are the, the two issues. Uh, the, your question on the outlook of 29% that we are projecting for the rest of the year and what that means for monetary policy going forward. I think you know that I won't answer that question. <laughs> because we will do what we have to do to get to our inflation target. But I, I, yeah, that's all that I can tell you. Now, now, now oh yeah, CD has been stable going into 2024 because every Christmas people order goods and then January they have to pay the bills and therefore uh, the currency comes under pressure. Meanwhile, this year it didn't happen. In February, since February to now, the CD has been stable. So sometimes these seasonal things don't happen. It didn't happen last year. And... Maybe next day it may happen, but even if it does, we think that we would have enough buffers to be able to manage the the exchange rate uh, going into 2024. Everybody knows that going into 2024, the challenges will be there, but that's why we are here to try to manage those challenges and, and keep the ship stable going into the elections for 2024. And then something about international remittance firms and their exchange rates. Remember these remittance firms, including the fintechs, they work with the banks, right? So if you say the rates are high, then the banks are equally guilty of, of, of that charge. And we are looking at, you know, reining them in uh, without necessarily trying to control, you know, the exchange rate. The financial markets department here has had several meetings with the remittance firms, and those meetings would continue. We find that the conduct in the foreign exchange market is very important for the currency stability. Since we started doing the foreign exchange uh, forward auctions for the BDCs uh, that has improved conduct in the foreign exchange market uh, and that is helping and I believe that the conduct of these remittance firms would also be important in keeping the currency uh, stable. Justice, your question was still on the Ghana 
financial stability funds. Yes, they will be an important source of capital for banks that are, are unlisted and, and banks that need assistance uh, to recapitalize. As I said, we would expect that by latest first week, second week of October, all the details on the processes will be out. Your second question on portfolio reversals of, okay, on portfolio reversals of last year. You see, I didn't really want to go into some of these discussions, but Bank of Ghana does not have direct reporting obligations to parliament. So the governor would not just have gotten up suddenly and go to parliament and go and tell the parliamentarians that we are seeing this and therefore get government to cut down their expenditures. It doesn't work that way. So we have a system where the reporting obligations of the central bank is through the Minister of Finance. So let's understand the roles. The roles are very clear. And the Bank of Ghana law is very clear on the reporting lines. Maybe I should leave it there before I say too much. <laughs> Regulatory loopholes, you talked about men's gold and the issue. The, yes, at least since the men's gold incident, we now have the Financial Stability Council. Financial Stability Council brings all the regulators together. Bank of Ghana, SEC, MPRA, National Insurance Commission. We have a quarterly meeting where we discuss, you know, developments in the market. And we believe that that should help, you know, deal with this issue about uh, regulatory gaps, which people take advantage of. Because now all the regulators have a forum where they meet to discuss developments as they unfold. So that said, thank you all very much for coming and we'll see you at the next MPC which is in in November. Okay. Thank you very much.